Okay, here we go. <laughs> Sorry. As Facebook Sheryl Sandberg calls him. Hey, it's number one best-selling author and motivational speaker, Eric Qualman. Most of you know me as Equal Man. On today's seven super tips, we're gonna get seven amazing tips from the one and only Barack Obama. And the one thing that I love about engaging with the Obamas over the course of time is that they've really set their schedule, meaning they've taken control of their schedule. That if you don't take control of your schedule, someone else will. Specifically, I've got two young daughters, and when they came into the White House, they had two young daughters. And so they put guardrails in place, especially Michelle, to make sure that they were eating dinner with their two kids every night as much as they possibly could. So I love that about the Obamas and how they set those guardrails, making sure that family's first, and also about that they're willing to accept that you have to fail fast, fail forward, and fail better. So I'm done talking, let's get into it. Let's get in the seven super tips from the one and only Barack Obama. You may have setbacks and you may have failures, but you're not done. You're not even getting started, not by a long shot. And if you ever forget that, just look to history. Thomas Paine was a failed corset maker, a failed teacher, and a failed tax collector before he made his mark on history with a little book called Common Sense that helped ignite a revolution. <laughs> Julia Child didn't publish her first cookbook until she was almost 50. Colonel Sanders didn't open up his first Kentucky Fried Chicken until he was in his 60s. Winston Churchill was dismissed as little more than a has-been who enjoyed scotch a little bit too much before he took over as Prime Minister and saw Great Britain through its finest hour. No one thought a former football player stocking shells at the local supermarket would return to the game he loved, become a Super Bowl MVP, and then come here to Arizona and lead your Cardinals to their first Super Bowl. Your body of work is never done. Each of them, at one point in their life, didn't have any title or much status to speak of, but they had passion, a commitment to following that passion wherever it would lead, and to working hard every step along the way. Well, with respect to failure, uh, it's terrible, but, <laughs> but, but necessary. Uh, if, 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 you, if you are going to try something hard, if you're putting yourself out there in some way, there are going to be times where you screw up or you don't succeed. Or there are times where you do everything right and you still don't succeed. Um, but that's not just true of politics or uh, running a not-for-profit. That's true. Some of you talked about being entrepreneurial. If, if you're starting a clothing line, hey, that's, that's a cutthroat business. It, you know, I'm sure you... I have every confidence say, Adam, that you're going to succeed at some point, but you'll go through some failures. Uh, you know, and, and I think that the most important thing, and, and this is a little bit of a cliche, but sometimes cliches are true, is to learn from those failures uh, and to have a sense of resilience and be able to examine what is it that I did not succeed at why didn't I succeed, and what do I need to do better? I want to highlight two main problems with that old, tired, me-first approach to life. First of all, it distracts you from what's truly important. And it may lead you to compromise your values and your principles and your commitments. Think about it. It's in chasing titles and status, in worrying about the next election rather than the national interest and the interests of those who you're supposed to represent that politicians so often lose their ways in Washington. They spend time thinking about polls, but not about principle. It was in pursuit of gaudy short-term profits and the bonuses that came with them that so many folks lost their way on Wall Street, engaging in extraordinary risks with other people's money. In contrast, the leaders we revere 
the businesses and institutions that last, they are not generally the result of a narrow pursuit of popularity or personal advancement, but of devotion to some bigger purpose, the preservation of the Union, or the determination to lift a country out of a depression, the creation of a quality product, a commitment to your customers, your workers, your shareholders, and your community, a commitment to make sure that an institution like ASU is inclusive and diverse and giving opportunity to all. That's the hallmark of real success. Which brings me to the second point. Just as Morehouse has taught you to expect more of yourselves, inspire those who look up to you to expect more of themselves. We know that too many young men in our community continue to make bad choices. And I have to say, growing up, I made quite a few myself. Sometimes I wrote off my own failings as just as another example of the world trying to keep a black man down. I had a tendency sometimes to make excuses for me not doing the right thing. But one of the things that all of you have learned over the last four years is there's no longer any room for excuses. I understand there's, there's a common fraternity creed here at, at Morehouse. Excuses are tools of the incompetent used to build bridges to nowhere and monuments of nothingness. Well, we've got no time for excuses. Not because the bitter legacy of slavery and segregation have vanished entirely, they have not. Not because racism and discrimination no longer exist. We know those are still out there. It's just that in today's hyper-connected, hyper-competitive world with millions of young people from China and India and Brazil, many of whom started with a whole lot less than all of you did, all of them entering the global workforce alongside you, nobody is going to give you anything that you have not earned. Nobody cares how tough your upbringing was. Nobody cares if you suffered some discrimination. And moreover, you have to remember that whatever you've gone through, it pales in comparison to the hardships previous generations endured, and they overcame them. And if they overcame them, you can overcome them too. You know, the, the political race I lost was to uh, Congressman Bobby Rush. And you know, when I, when I, I it's interesting because I'm writing uh, uh, a book right now about sort of my political journey. And, and when I, as I was writing, when I thought about that race, what I was reminded of was the degree to which that was probably the sole time in my political career where I think I ran more just because it was the next thing rather than running because I had a good theory of what it is that I wanted to do. And this is a mistake I think a lot of folks who get into politics make. And so when I see White House interns or I talk to young people, I always tell them, worry less about what you want to be and worry more about what you want to do. Because when you, when you, um, what, what, when, when you're more concerned with, I want to be a congressman or I want to be a senator or I want to be rich, uh, then, you know, some people may succeed in chasing that, uh, that goal, but when they get there, they don't know what to do with it. And if they don't get there, they don't have anything to show for it. But if you're worrying about, I want to improve education in low-income neighborhoods, or I want to deal with climate change and help save the planet, or I, then whatever you're doing in pursuit of that goal, uh, in and of itself is going to be worthwhile, it, and it's going to teach you things, and it's going to 
put you in a position to have an impact. And then if it turns out as a result that you also end up being successful uh, uh, in, in, in politics uh, or whatever thing you're pursuing, then uh, so much the better. The, the most successful business people that I know, uh, you know Bill Gates didn't start off saying, I'm, I want to be the richest man in the world. He started off saying to himself, I, I really think these computers are cool and I want to write cool software. That's what he wanted to do. Worked out well for him. Um, but, but, so, so, so I think that's, uh, uh, that's with respect to the failure issue. If, if you're focused on uh, giving of yourself to accomplish something, then even when you fail at a particular objective, you're still succeeding in learning about how you can uh, uh, accomplish those goals. Uh, and it doesn't just become about you. You know, if, if you think about this country, what, what's happened is typically that uh, we've gone in spurts. Sometimes we make progress, yeah. uh, the civil rights movement yeah. or, or abolition. Uh, and then sometimes we go into dark times. Uh, but the general trajectory uh, is upward. Yeah, one of my favorite sayings Martin Luther King once said, uh, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. You know, it, 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 you can't always see it, but out on the horizon, it's moving in the direction. Okay, of so but you do not feel that these are dark times. Well, I think th I think they're troubling times, and I think they're troubling times for a couple of reasons. I, I think they're troubling times because uh, we feel cynical about government. Yeah. Uh, we don't get a sense that uh, the challenges that we're facing in terms of educating our kids to compete and making sure that uh, everybody has health care and right. uh, dealing right. with the energy problems that you we called have. It, there's something I'd never heard this phrase before. You called it a coarsening of the culture. Well, I, and, and, and you see it all our the time. Our belief in materialism and all of that. And, and you, see it, you, you see it uh, in our youth. Yeah. And you see it at the highest reaches of government. Uh, a sense that uh, it's more important to be powerful or to be wealthy than it is to, to do right. Young people like Jasmine Perez from Roma, Texas. Jasmine didn't speak English when she first started school. Neither of her parents had gone to college. But she worked hard, earned good grades, and got a scholarship to Brown University as now in graduate school studying public health on her way to becoming Dr. Jasmine Perez. I'm thinking about Andoni Schultz from Los Altos, California, who's fought brain cancer since he was three. He's had to endure all sorts of treatments and surgeries, one of which affected his memory, so it took him much longer, hundreds of extra hours, to do his schoolwork. But he never fell behind. He's headed to college this fall. And then there's Chantel Steve from my hometown of Chicago, Illinois. Even when bouncing from foster home to foster home in the toughest neighborhoods in the city, she managed to get a job at a local health care center start a program to keep young people out of gangs, and she's on track to graduate high school with honors and go on to college. And Jasmine, and Doni, and Chantel aren't any different from any of you. They face challenges in their lives just like you do. In some cases, they've got it a lot worse off than many of you. But they refuse to give up. They chose to take responsibility for their lives, for their education, and set goals for themselves. And I expect all of you to do the same. And that's why today I'm calling on each of you to set your own goals for your education and do everything you can to meet them. Your goal can be something as simple as doing all your homework, paying attention in class, or spending some time each day reading a book. Maybe you'll decide to get involved in an extracurricular activity or volunteer in your community. Maybe you'll decide to stand up for kids who are being teased or bullied because of who they are or how they look. Because you believe, like I do, that all young people deserve a safe environment to study and learn. Maybe you'll decide to take better care of yourself so you can be more ready to learn. And along those lines, by the way, I hope all of you are washing your hands a lot and that you stay home from school when you don't feel well so we can keep people from getting the flu this fall and winter. But whatever you resolve to do, I want you to commit to it. I want you to really work at it. I know that sometimes you get that sense from TV that you can 
be rich and successful without any hard work, that your ticket to success is through rapping or basketball or being a reality TV star, chances are you're not going to be any of those things. The truth is, being successful is hard. You won't love every subject that you study. You won't click with every teacher that you have. Not every homework assignment will seem completely relevant to your life right at this minute. And you won't necessarily succeed at everything the first time you try. That's OK. Some of the most successful people in the world are the ones who've had the most failures. J.K. Rawlings, who wrote Harry Potter, her first Harry Potter book was rejected 12 times before it was finally published. Michael Jordan was cut from his high school basketball team. He lost hundreds of games and missed thousands of shots during his career. But he once said, I have failed over and over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeed. These people succeeded because they understood that you can't let your failures define you. You have to let your failures teach you. You have to let them show you what to do differently the next time. So if you get into trouble, that doesn't mean you're a troublemaker. It means you need to try harder to act right. If you get a bad grade, that doesn't mean you're stupid. It just means you need to spend more time studying. No one's born being good at all things. You become good at things through hard work. You're not a varsity athlete the first time you play a new sport. You don't hit every note the first time you sing a song. You've got to practice. The same principle applies to your schoolwork. You might have to do a math problem a few times before you get it right. You might have to read something a few times before you understand it. You definitely have to do a few drafts of a paper before it's good enough to hand in. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to ask for help when you need it. I do that every day. Asking for help isn't a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength. Because it shows you have the courage to admit when you don't know something, and that then allows you to learn something new. So find an adult that you trust, a parent, a grandparent, or a teacher, a coach, or a counselor, and ask them to help you stay on track to meet your goals. And even when you're struggling, even when you're discouraged, and you feel like other people have given up on you, don't ever give up on yourself. That's it for today's seven super tips from Barack Obama. This is your host, Eric Qualman. I hope that you find these helpful. If you do, we'll keep them coming every week if you subscribe to our YouTube channel here and now. And remember, until the next seven super tips, it's not what we take from the world, it's what we leave behind. Oh man, that drills loud. Let me try to think about the last time I tried to thought. Okay, pressure's on. Come on, dude, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Come on.